Welcome, welcome, welcome. I would like to welcome you to episode 433 of the Unpopular Podcast. This is the man, the myth, the legend, Jalen Hunter. Here at the Unpopular Podcast, not only ask you to agree with me, I ask you to hear me out. Here at the Unpopular Podcast, I, I don't wish for anyone to fail at all. I want everyone to succeed. I want everyone to be the best that they can be. In that same breath, <clears throat> excuse me, I want everyone to put themselves in the best position possible to win. I think that's where success and failure in a lot of aspects lie. Where you put in the best position to win, where you put in the best position to be successful. Over since last episode, the biggest news pretty much in sports has been J.J. Redick getting the head coaching job for the L.A. Lakers. And a lot of people are coming to me and seeing what I said last time about how I didn't think the Lakers job was that desirable when we were talking about Dan Campbell. I mean, not Dan Campbell. I'm sorry. Dan Hurley and Dan Hurley leaving. UConn and should he leave UConn or should he go to the Lakers and I was adamant in saying I don't think the UConn job is less than the Lakers at this point well as we sit here today JJ Reddick signs a four-year deal uh as we're recording this I don't know exactly I don't know if the number has been released but he signs a four-year deal My initial thoughts were, well, this is the name that we've heard. You know, we the Lakers have been without a coach since the end of the season, obviously firing Darvin Ham. And the name that we heard circulate was J.J. Redick. And a lot of people want to link, can link it to the newly formed podcast that him and LeBron James, who obviously is the star of the Lakers, uh, has. And that was... For what people are saying, I'm not saying I don't know, but people are saying that was kind of a avenue to help J.J. Redick look more appetizing to the Lakers. Again, I want to I want to refer to the tag. <laughs> I want to refer to the start of this episode when I said that I don't want anyone to fail. Yes, obviously, there's biases in what I say. Obviously, I have a bias towards all Washington teams, even though we are not good. Like, I'm always going to ride for the Commanders. I'm always going to ride for the Wizards, the Capitals, um, you know, the Mystics, all those teams. So, in that case, obviously, there's bi bi biases with that. But I want everyone to succeed. With that being said, and as and, and please keep that in your mind moving forward as we talk about this. We're going to talk about Monty Williams a little bit later in the show and the Monty Williams situation and the J.J. Reddick situation obviously are different. J.J. Reddick is coming into something. Monty Williams is, is getting or got fired from something. So don't compare it in the sense of that, but. As, as crazy as it sounds, and I know people are going to start typing away, people are going to get crazy with it, and I get it. I'm, I'm here for it. I do appreciate the support, and I appreciate you guys listening. But as crazy as it sounds, you take away that 2020 NBA championship, the Lakers job has not been, the Lakers job has been closer to the Detroit Pistons job than anything. Yes, the Lakers have a rich history. They have 17 championships in their in their lineage. They probably, if you were to compile the best players they've ever had, they would probably have the greatest team in basketball history. LeBron James, Kobe Bryant, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Shaquille O'Neal, Walt Chamberlain. The the history is rich. And I will never take anything away from the history of the L.A. Lakers. What I'm talking about is recent history. 
championships, everyone plays for a championship, obviously. And that is the goal. The goal is to win an NBA championship. But one thing that we've seen is that championships kind of cloud people's or cloud what's really there. And that 2020 championship, along with having LeBron James, along with having Anthony Davis, has made people think that this Lakers team is is still one of those marquee marquee teams. And, and what I mean by that is I'm not talking about pr- profit. I'm not talking about how much that is. I'm saying when I say when, what, how I'm talking about marquee team, I'm talking about one of those teams that can actually contend for a championship. This Lakers team is far from that. And honestly, you take away that 2020 championship, the Lakers team hasn't been good for what? Almost 14 years now? You see, the Lakers are one of those teams, and the Boston Celtics are one of those teams for a minute until, obviously, their resurgence and and winning a championship this year. But the Lakers are one of those teams that people cling so heavily to the past that it allows them, or it doesn't allow them to look at the present. And it doesn't allow them to understand, yo, this team is a lot further from a championship than you really think. Another thing that kind of gotten got misconstrued or allowed the clap or let me say this. Another thing that allowed fans, allowed people to cloud their judgment on the Lakers is make it to the Western Conference Finals last year. It was like, whoa, if they make it to the Western Conference Finals, how? How are they so far from a championship? Well, let me remind you. They got swept in the Western Conference Finals by the Lake or by the the ascent, the NBA champions at that time now, Denver Nuggets. And they had to play an undersized aging Golden State Warriors. Now, yes, you play who's in front of you, but if they would have played someone like, I don't know, the Kings, it might have been a different story. If they would have played a healthy Memphis Grizzlies, it might have been a different story. I'm saying all this to say this. Insert J.J. Redick. Insert a coach now. Who has this is his first coaching job, unless he's coached Little League, unless he's coached something that I don't know. This is his first coaching job to coach the Los Angeles Lakers. And along with everything that I just said, there is a level of whether it's warranted or not. There is a expectation that you're supposed to be good. There's an expectation that you're supposed to win now. Because the Lakers in the past is so used to winning, that's what they want. That's what that that been the Lakers being good, the Boston Celtics being good, the Golden State Warriors being good, that benefits that benefits the team greatly. And I don't I don't see it. I talked about um Dan Hurley and I talked about they were saying I think he was supposed to get maybe a long-term contract. And when you look at when you look at what uh what JJ Reddick got, he got 4 years. You would think that 4 years should be when you have LeBron James, you probably have him for about two, maybe three years. Anthony Davis, you should have him long term. That's that's what you feel. But with this Lakers team, I don't. Th- I think you have one, maybe two years tops. If this team looks anything like it's looked the last few years, you do not have <laughs> four years, my brother. Again, it's all about expectation. I wish the best for J.J. Redick, but I don't think that J.J. Redick was put into a win 
win a win win situation. I think it's good that you got your first, especially if you want to be a coach. It's good that you got your first coaching job, but there's so much expectation on that that it's almost impossible to live up to because of the roster that you have. Because the expectation, obviously, when you when you put on the purple and gold is championships. But you don't have a championship caliber team. And when we talk about when we talk the Lakers just by name and by having LeBron, having Anthony Davis are viewed as a championship caliber franchise when in actuality they haven't been that in a while and I it's it's as unfortunate as it is it's hard for me to see a road of success or a road for success for J for JJ Reddick because of everything that is at your disposal I think that, as quiet as it's kept, I think that's one reason why it was difficult finding a new coach for the Lakers. The, as much as people want to say it is, the Lakers aren't the most glamorous franchise right now. Because any coach going into it now, it being J.J. Redick, understands that your, your, your margin of error the clock in which that you have is a lot shorter than it should be because it's the Lakers and because the expectations are so daunting. And on top of that, they're going to look and say, well, you're the Lakers. You have LeBron James. You have Anthony Davis. Why are you not successful? So while J.J. Redick did sign a four-year contract, I don't. if he doesn't come get off to a good start, I don't foresee him being here in four years as unfortunate as it is. And that's the fear that you have playing for a t or coaching a team that has unrealistic expectations, at least when we look at the team that is constructed. And if we're talking about free agency, I don't see, I mean, I, I don't see much change in this team unless they swing and get somebody big like Paul George, which I doubt that's going to happen, like a Donovan Mitchell, maybe like a like a DeMar DeRozan. I don't know. It could happen, but I don't see it. To me, shouts out to J.J. Redick uh, for getting the job, but I don't, I don't, I don't foresee much success if. The current roster stays how it is. And honestly, in the next few years, I see major changes seeing as though your best player, arguably the greatest player ever, may not be there. And another another thing I want to talk about with this J.J. Reddick thing. And it's obvious. We saw, we almost saw this with the I don't remember the team, but they're about to hire Josh McCown, who had absolutely like I think the only coaching experience he had was um, coaching like his son's football team. J.J. Redick is not qualified right now to be the head coach of the L.A. Lakers. I think it's crazy that. Your very first head coaching job, not only is in the NBA, but is coaching a the one of the or probably the biggest or the most marquee franchise in basketball history. Obviously, there is a lot of candidates that probably deserved it more. There's a lot of coaches that have gone through the gauntlet of maybe doing college or going from team to team, getting trash team after trash team and and making the best out of what they could. And obviously, essentially, J.J. Reddick got the job. And LeBron James can say that he had absolutely nothing to do with J.J. Reddick getting the job. 
But it's very hard for me to believe that, seeing as though this is J.J. Reddick's very first coaching job. And I, when I mean, very, again, unless I, unless I don't know something, I don't, I don't even think he coaches AAU or something. I don't know. This is a, this is a. Uh, I mean, if you want to paint it as fair, then this is an unorthodox, obvious hiring, you know. And for people that say, when they look at a resume and be like, hey, I know I'm not qualified, that doesn't mean you shouldn't apply. Because <laughs> obviously, J.J. Reddick applied and he was ill-equipped. Um, I'm not going to make it a race thing. Because I honestly don't think it is a race thing this this time around. I just think that it is who you know. And I think that J.J. Reddick has aligned himself perfectly with the most important people for the Lakers. And number one is LeBron James. I think J.J. Reddick is a brilliant basketball mind. When you listen to his podcast and you listen to his podcast that he has, he, I think he has two of them. The one that he has with LeBron, the one that he has just by himself, he is a brilliant basketball mind, and I hope the best for him. And if this works, I think that this could open the door for something greater. This can open the door for more athletes. Uh, mind you, J.J. Redick was playing, what, four years ago. J.J. Redick, has, he went from playing basketball four years ago to now being the coach. Not even an assistant coach, nothing. He's, you know. So if this works, which obviously, like I said at the beginning, I want everyone to succeed. This could be the start of something monumental, something great, you know. And it could open the door for more former athletes to be coaches sooner than they originally would be able to. And you might not have to go through the grueling gun of being an assistant or doing this or doing that. You get to just be a coach if this works. But again, I would love for it to work. I just don't know if it will. Because of the expectations that are attached with this job. In, in particular, this team. But... Congratulations to J.J. Redick for being named the newest head coach of the L.A. Lakers or for the L.A. Lakers. Congratulations to you, my guy. Let's move forward. And I said I was going to talk about Monty Williams, and here we are. Monty Williams gets fired from the Detroit Pistons job. Now, Usually, I would look at this and say, what did you expect from Monty Williams? And in some, in, in, in a lot of retrospects, I do still agree with that. The Detroit Pistons have been awful for a while. In fact, the last time the Detroit Pistons were good and in the playoffs, I think they had a one-legged Blake Griffin. The Detroit Pistons have not been good for a while. They haven't even been a, a close to average in a while. And I understand that there is a semi-rich history, seeing as though they did win an NBA championship in 2004, I believe. But, oh, and obviously you have the Detroit Pistons back in the day, you know. Isaiah Thomas and Joe Dumars and, you know. But in recent memory, kind of like, or in recent times, kind of like the L.A. Lakers, but just to a much worse, and I mean much worse extent, the Detroit Pistons have been awful. The Detroit Pistons had a losing record last year. And this year they had a losing record under Monty Williams. Now, Monty Williams signed like a 65, 71 or something like that million dollar contract for like 
six, five, six years. And they fire him after one year. Now, I'm going to say this. I usually don't put much blame on a coach in a situation like this. I usually say, what the hell did you expect Monty Williams to do? You have one of the youngest rosters in basketball. Your best player was hurt in Cade Cunningham. Uh, you don't have too many high IQ players. Just front office, the GA, they kept doing weird trades, like trading for James Wiseman. Like, I'm just thinking, what do you expect Monty Williams to do in this situation? It's very, it would be very hard for the greatest coaches to turn around. Uh, this Detroit Pistons team. That's what I usually would say. And in a sense, that is that is still correct. And I'm still I still look at it like that, in a sense. But this is one of those times where Monty Williams didn't help himself. Monty Williams did not, there were some things that Monty Williams just you have to control the controllables. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Yeah, there was a good stretch where the Detroit I think they lost like almost 30 straight games. But but you have to control the controllables. You have to do great. You have to be great at your, what you can control, what you can and cannot do. If he I don't know if he has any say so or not, but you don't really have much say so in who the GM, who the owner, you know, trades for. You just have to work with what you have. Well, well, no, you don't have the best team. You don't have the best players. But some of the lineups that Monty Williams would run out, some of the Lions that line up, I'm sorry, that Monty Williams would trot out there was borderline criminal. Like the whole Killian Hayes experience. Why is Killian Hayes playing more minutes than Jade Ivey? In what galaxy, in what in what universe is Killian Hayes a better option than Jay than Jay Nivey? Look, I understand there's not much winning happening in Detroit. I get it. I think the Detroit Lions almost had more wins than the Detroit Pistons. So I get it. But at least Put yourself in the best position to win. Like, why is James Wiseman, you already see he's not that good of a player. Why is James Wiseman getting so many minutes? Why is Isaiah Stewart getting so many minutes alongside Marvin Bagley? On top of that, it's like some players he'd play just entirely too much and some players he doesn't play much at all like Jade Nivey like why is Isaiah Stewart and Jalen Duran playing together why are you why are you playing in an, a, an entire five man bench roster like why <laughs> that doesn't even work in 2k why are you doing this in real life Look, do I think Monty Williams is a good coach, good or bad coach? I, I think he's he's all right. I think he's a good coach. I mean, I see what he did in New Orleans. I think he's a good coach. And the only thing that kind of derailed him with New, in New Orleans is obviously personal, personal things that happened off the field with his, you know, wife and everything. Um, so, yes, I do think that put in the right scenarios and put in the right situations – um, Monty Williams could be a great coach, is a great coach. But I can also admit that he did not do a great job in Detroit. And as much as I want to see my people succeed, I don't think he did a good job. And I understand the firing now. As much as I understand the firing, let me let me talk about this.
Right now, you're seeing this with the Milwaukee Bucks. And obviously, we're seeing it with the Detroit Pistons. Monty Williams still has like 61 or $63 million left on his contract. You're paying Monty Williams north of $60 million to not coach your team. The Milwaukee Bucks are currently co- paying three coaches, three I understand that these decisions are difficult. I get it. I understand that it's not a complete science. You're not going to get it completely right every single time. But there there has to there has to be some type of penalty for this. I think I think the Gilbert Arenas podcast said it. If these coaching hires and fires and how much, you know, you have to pay them goes towards the the salary cap. I promise you things will change. All I'm saying is you have to understand. Look, if you're going if you're going to pay you, you have to understand the status of your team. That's what I was talking about with Doc Rivers, man. You have to hire the right person. And on top of hiring the right person, you have to understand the type of situation that they're getting into. You know the Detroit Pistons aren't that good. And again, I will also again reiterate that Monty Williams didn't do the best job. But you need to – one year? What the hell did you – yo, I understand that they lost more games this year than last year, but I think they only lost like three, four or five more games. This team is not good. This team is full of young players. Why, unless it was just irreparable, unless he lost the locker room, I don't know. But what I'm saying is it just doesn't make sense that they continue to fire coaches one, two years into a deal when they've given them a four, five, six-year deal for a team that should not have any expectations of winning. So now you're on the hook for paying this man 60 north of 60 million dollars to sit at home or to coach somewhere else because mind you i think if monty williams gets a head coaching job somewhere else they're still paying him oh and that's another thing i want to talk about and it kind of ties back to the first uh the jj reddick because I heard a couple people say the Lakers should hire Monty Williams or should look at Monty Williams. I think Chris Broussard said that on um, First Things First. Shout out to them. I will say this. I think there are coaches that... Again, ugh, man, I hate to beat a dead horse, bro, but it goes back to the... Um, it goes back to the the Milwaukee Bucks. You have to know who you're hiring as a coach. Look at look at most of the successful teams in any sport. You know, like look at the Kansas City Chiefs. Yes, I understand that it is definitely a cheat code that you have arguably the greatest quarterback of all time in Patrick Mahomes, arguably the greatest tight end of all time in Travis Kelsey. But I'm almost a thousand percent sure they would not see even a glimpse of the success that they've seen if they didn't have Andy Reid, who is the perfect coach for that situation. As much as you want to say it was more about Brady, it was more about Belichick, the coaching tutelage of Bill Belichick is a big reason why the New England Patriots saw greatness. The... We even saw it with the Golden State Warriors. I know people are going to, if you have a bingo card and you have, Jalen's going to talk about the Golden State Warriors. Well, there you go. The Golden State Warriors wouldn't be nearly as good as they were. Even with Mark Jackson, Mark Jackson did a, did a hell of a job. But they, hiring the right coach, Steve Kerr unlocked the Golden State Warriors to the dynasty that we saw. What I'm saying is coaching is important. 
and you have to hire the right coach. And I think Monty Williams may not be the best coach for a young team, but I think that he could be a better coach for a more seasoned, a more veteran related team because they can connect to him more. There's a reason why I didn't think Doc Rivers was a good coach for the Milwaukee Bucks because of his track record with guards and how he has never been good at coaching an offensive minded guard. And now you have Damian Lillard and you see now, yes, you can you can chalk it up to injury, but you see how that ended this year. So. I'm not mad at people saying that Monty Williams should have been or could have been considered considered for the Lakers job. I don't think the Lakers job needs a kid or I don't think a Lakers the Lakers job needs a player that can connect with with younger players. Like I think Monty Williams would be a t- in fact, let me back up. I think JJ Redick would be a terrible coach for the Houston Rockets. Because most of those players are, like, extremely younger than him. Like, you think, like, I I wouldn't see, I I wouldn't see J.J. Reddick being successful trying to coach Jalen Green and and Sangoon or or Torrey Eason. I I don't see it. I think that when you have a veteran-related team, and while, yes, J.J. Reddick, LeBron James is older than J.J. Reddick, but J.J. Reddick is a new coach, first time coaching. You don't want a young squad to coach. You want a veteran later squad so they understand. And some of the mis- misfortunes or some of the things that you don't know, they can still pick up on. I get that. And I think that, that I just Monty Williams just doesn't seem like the type of coach that can connect with a younger. Maybe he has. It seems like from all the reports that he is one of those old old school coaches and sometimes it doesn't work with the new school and you have he's coaching one of the youngest te- or was coaching one of the youngest teams in basketball again I think Monty Williams has a shot to be a, a, a good coach and hopefully coach again if he wants but two things in this instance is very true he wasn't really given the opportunity to succeed as much as he probably should. And on top of that, the opportunities that he was given, he didn't do the best with. So I think that while I would hope, um, while I would hope that you'd give somebody longer especially when they have a multi-year deal you give them longer than one year i also understand that monty williams didn't do the greatest job with the team that he had so we'll see and let's move forward um you know why a lot of people are upset with the milwaukee bucks right now You know why when you look, there are certain teams, there are certain GMs, there are certain organizations that you feel constantly win trades? It's because they're smart. A lot of people are upset with Milwaukee right now is because they feel that with Milwaukee getting Damian Lillard and having to let go or deciding to let go of Drew Holiday, and obviously, Drew Holiday going to the Blazers. The Blazers then, I think, buying him out. Drew Holiday goes to the Celtics. And he was a major reason why the Celtics essentially won a championship this year. There are acquisitions. There are times when you look at a transaction, you look at a trade and say that this trade is going to be monumental. One way or another. And there's usually one sucker in a trade. There's usually one player, one side that just doesn't, just, just, 
you know. What I'm talking about is for the first time in God knows how long, I don't remember the last time I've seen a one-for-one trade. I don't remember the last time I've seen a player get traded for a player and there's no picks added. But Alex Caruso was traded to the Oklahoma City Thunder for Josh Giddy. When this trade came across my timeline, I think that the initial feeling was this is probably one of the worst trades I've ever seen. Um, yeah, this is one of the worst trades I've ever seen for a multitude of reasons. And on top of that, I was like, yo, there's always moments that'll show you how a franchise or why a franchise is or how they arrive to where they are. You know, people look at obviously during COVID, the, the, big talk of COVID in the sports world was the last dance. And, you know, you see from when, LeBron, you know, the, the dynasty that was the, the Bulls. And a lot of people ask, how do you go from arguably the greatest dynasty in basketball or probably inarguably the greatest dynasty in basketball history? Now, obviously, you have the Celtics that rival that, um, Lakers to a certain extent, but we saw one of, I'll just say one of, one of the greatest dynasties in basketball history. How do we go from that to whatever the hell the, the, the Bulls are? And obviously they chronicled the times after uh, Jordan and, and that, that dynasty, but there's a lot of things that can... I'm not even going to just say a dynasty. There's a lot of things that can crush. There's a lot of things that can destroy. There's a lot of things that can derail playoff teams. Injuries. People not living up to their expectations. People not living up to their contracts. Trades. Front office moves. Coaching personnel going in and out. There's a lot of things that can derail a, a good team. And when I look at this Bulls team, I can I can point back time after time after time where they have gotten in their own way. I'm not even going to talk about Derrick Rose. Even though you can talk about Derrick Rose and talk about the fact of why is he in the game when you're up double digits with like a minute left in a playoff game. That's neither here nor there. Let's just focus on this trade. Alex, Alex Caruso for Josh Giddy. To understand how idiotic this trade is, let me let, let's first talk about who else is on the Bulls. You have Lonzo Ball, who obviously hasn't been playing for a while due to injury, but all signs are looking like he possibly could be playing next season. DeMar DeRozan, uh, DeSamu, uh, Kobe White. Now Josh Giddy. You know what all of them have in common? They're guards. On top of that, out, only one of those guards are dependable shooters. Why is that so important? Let's look at the last five NBA champions. The last five. I think that's a good sample size. Out of the last five champions, only one, the 2020 LA Lakers, only one wasn't a good three-point shooting team. This year, the the... Boston Celtics shot the most threes in NBA history as a team. The, the Denver Nuggets were amongst the, 
the league leaders in three points made. Golden State Warriors, come on now. Milwaukee Bucks, Chris Middleton, Drew Holiday, Pat Connington, great three-point shooters. Obviously, the 2020 Lakers, which we just talked about. I'm not saying that you have to. Obviously, every team has um, individuality. Obviously, you you don't want your team to be a carbon copy of another team. But what I would think is if there is a trend in the league, and that trend is directly involved with championship, I would hope that you lean into that trend. Well, you give up. Not saying, I mean, I understand that Alex Caruso only shot... Let me see. He only shot 41% from the three-point line, which is incredible. In fact, shooting 41% from three last year, you know who he shot better than? Clay Thompson. You give him up for Josh Giddy. Now, if you want a little bit more perspective on Mr. Giddy, and trust me, I'm not even going to talk about all the off-court issues. Josh Giddy a year ago, shot ah, 34%. That is awful. Bro, you, you, you give up a player that is, uh, he was on the, all NBA defensive team, the second team this year for a player that struggles defensively now for some reason. First and foremost, on top of all this, why not trade if you're going to trade him? Because I'm not saying trading Alex Crusoe was dumb. I'm saying if you're going to trade Alex Crusoe, why not trade him when his market is at the highest? Why not tra- trade him near the near the trade deadline? And why are you prioritizing trading him when you have Zach Levine who's still on the team? Huh. <sighs> It's just it's just stupidity, in my opinion. Now, obviously, I could be wrong. Josh Giddy can turn out to be the greatest thing the Bulls have ever had since Jordan. But the likelihood of that happening is slim to none. Mind you, Josh Giddy was a player that the Josh Giddy had ample opportunity. Josh Giddy got benched in the playoffs. You remember that? And you're trading, you're you're trading arguably your most consistent player for a player that got benched in the playoffs. Talking about, oh, we like the upside for Josh Giddy. The fuck, man. And again, I'm not even going to talk about the off the court issues. I am going to talk I'm talking about the fact if you have now a a log jam at guard what are you going to do I think this and that's another thing bro the word rebuild man Washington does this crap a lot too bro at what point are you going to get out the rebuild there has to be some point where you go from rebuild to to contender or a solid team. They're just going to be this is just another opportunity or another situation where the Chicago Bulls are going to be slightly above 500. They're going to make the play in, probably lose, and now they don't have a good draft pick. All because you think Josh Giddy is a better option than your most consistent player in Alex Caruso. And I started this talking about uh, the Boston Celtics and Drew Holiday. 
when you looked at uh when you look at this Sam Presti is one of those GMs that you just don't you, you, there's always a level of skepticism making a deal with uh with Sam Presti because when you look up it always looks like the Oklahoma City Thunder just win the trade by a landslide. Bro, you didn't have to give up one of his 25 million picks that he has for the next five, 10 years. You didn't have to give up one of those picks. And if you're rebuilding, that's another thing. If the Bulls are actually rebuilding, why not get a pick? Because the best way to rebuild is to go through the draft. That's why I, I don't think, again, I don't remember the last time we saw a straight-up player-for-player trade. Because if you're talking about rebuild, you usually rebuild through the draft. So why not get a draft pick for a player that was just represented on the all-defensive second team? And I could argue deserved to be on the first team. It just doesn't make sense how an organization can, can. That's why I talk about poverty franchises. Some the worst part is some of these franchises don't know. They may know their poverty franchises. They don't know how to get out of that because this is, in my opinion, for as I'm looking at it right now. You guys know if I'm wrong, I will come in here and say I'm wrong. I have no problem doing that. But this looks like a, a terrible trade. Especially if you're gonna if you're trying to sell your fan base on oh this is a rebuild. Well, this is a rebuild. Why not get a draft pick? If it's a rebuild, why is Zach Levine still on the team? Why is Lonzo Ball still on the team? Why is Demar Derozan still on the team? Now, yes, they this could be the first domino, but again, you did not get a draft pick, and you got a player that is such a diminishing asset. I understand he's only been in the league for three years. He's such a diminishing asset. Maybe he just needed a new because he was pretty good his first two years. Maybe he just needed a fresh start. But I'm almost sure that Chicago is not that fresh start. It's just it's so confusing. I don't you know it's confusing because I don't know what the Bulls are doing. I don't know what direction they're going in. And honestly, this move kind of makes me feel like they don't know the direction that they're going in. Because if you're going to trade him, why not trade him when his stock is higher? Why not trade him for it? I'm almost sure you could have got somebody better if you wanted to do a player for player. You could have got somebody better for Alex Caruso. Alex Caruso could change the fortunes for the Golden State Warriors. You probably could have got someone better. You probably could have got somebody much more impactful to your team than Josh Giddy. A player, by the way, that obviously the Thunder wanted to get off of. Oh, man. And for the Thunder, I'm not saying that this is a championship caliber, or I'm not saying that this propels them to championship status, but this makes their team a team that was number one in the West, might I add you. This makes them incredibly more difficult. This makes them much better. Now you have yet another defender. Josh Giddy is uh, not Josh Giddy. Alex Caruso is probably their best on ball defender outside of Lou Dort. So now you have, to my opinion, two of the two of the best on ball defenders, and you have somebody that shoots forty one percent from three last year. And where did the Thunder struggle most in the playoffs? Defending the guards, defending. Uh, Luka Doncic defending Kyrie Irving and hitting threes. Well, you got that in Alex Caruso. Alex Caruso, man, is a game changer. And again, I'm not saying this is a championship caliber move. I'm not saying they will win a championship, but this is a championship caliber move for the Oklahoma City Thunder. You see that a lot. I know. I think I've talked about this before, but you see that much more than I think we should. 
great teams feasting on bottom feeders. A great team like the Boston Celtics allow the <laughs> letting the Trailblazers feasting on the Trailblazers' decision to j- just get off of a former <laughs> a former champion in Drew Holiday, who is still I'm not going to say in his prime, but still has plenty of years left. Or or even though they haven't won a championship, you see time and time again how mismanaged Bradley Bill was for Washington. Phoenix swoop in. Now, yes, I'm not saying that that has been a slam dunk for either team, but what I'm saying is I can tell you who the best player in that entire situation is. This is yet yet another example of a team getting taken advantage of and just allowing it. Because trust and believe, Alex Caruso is much, much, much better player than Josh Giddy. And he will do wonders for a team in Oklahoma City that literally just was the number one seed in the in the in the West and has a stockpile of draft picks that they could use for trades with rebuilding teams that are actually rebuilding and and know how to rebuild smartly because you don't rebuild with just other players. You rebuild through the draft. But hey. Maybe the Bulls know something that I don't, that the history of the NBA doesn't. Oh, boy. We'll see. That's another thing, bro. Like, what now what are you going to do with Andre Drummond? He's probably gone. Like, what are you doing? with? What is the Bulls doing? At least you can, your futures rest on Josh Giddy. <laughs> yeah. Let's move forward, man. And, and let's get off of sports. Let's get off of sports because, uh, yeah. I had to talk about it. This will be the last thing I talk about, but I had to talk about it. You ever watch something and that feeling of, or, or you ever had that feeling where you're watching something and you think to yourself, this is historic that I'm watching. I don't think I will ever watch something like this again. I don't think something like this again will ever happen. That's happened a couple times. And the most recent time has happened is when I watched on Juneteenth. Shouts out to everyone. You know, happy Juneteenth to everyone. Uh, but when I watched the Kendrick Lamar or Kenny and Friend pop out uh, show, I watched it on Amazon Prime. Which is awesome. We'll talk about it in a second. Um, I was sitting there watching it. And I just, I couldn't get over the feeling of, yo, this, I don't think we will ever see this again. This, at first going into it, I thought that it was mainly going to just be Kendrick, Kendrick Lamar pretty much stomping on 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 Drake's grave after the whole beef. I just thought it was going to be a Kendrick Lamar pretty much a victory lap. And it was I am pleasantly shocked that it was so much more than that. Now, I probably shouldn't be shocked seeing as though we're dealing with someone And we're talking about someone in Kendrick Lamar that his entire career has been calculated and has been. I don't think Kendrick Lamar has made a bad decision in his career. So obviously. There was a level of surprise that it wasn't just a, oh, we're here to to stomp on Drake's uh, professional career. But it was so, so much more than that. Now, I am not going to lie. 
I'm not a thug. <laughs> I'm not a gang member. I, I, I don't. I'm never going to portray myself to be that. Nor am I from California. I am from Maryland. I, I'm not. I'm not a West Coast kid. So. As somebody that's watching this from the north, from Maryland, not having any ties to California and still feeling that this is historic. This is something that we will never see again. I can only imagine how it was and how it felt for people from California, people in California. Kendrick Lamar pretty much uniting all the gangs that are out there. Seeing artist after artist after artist after artist go on stage from Tyler the Creator, uh, West Side Boogie, uh, Black Hippie, YG, Ty Dolla Sign. To seeing athletes, you know, LeBron James was there, Russell Westbrook, uh, DeMar DeRozan, James Harden, Kawhi Leonard was there. And the show that all these people put on, especially Kendrick Lamar. I don't, I, it's, it's hard for me to think we will ever see anything like that again. That was probably one of the most historic nights, not just in musical history. I think that this is probably one of the most historic nights in American history. Now, obviously, people are probably going to say that I'm sicing it, but it's, it's, it's bigger than that, man. Kendrick Lamar has solidified himself as arguably the greatest artists of his generation at least one of the greatest artists of his generation not just because of the Kendrick and uh, Kendrick and Drake beef but because of the power that he holds with his voice with his actions the power that he holds the the just the the power that his his Actions hold. I don't think. I don't think there's anyone. And that's no offense to anyone. I don't think there's anyone in the rap world. Because obviously we're talking about hip hop. I don't think there's anybody in the rap world. That could have done. What. Kendrick Lamar did. Bringing out as many people. As he brought out. And. Just the people that came to support with him. Because trust and believe, while yes, this was a triumph and this was a a, a nod to just West Coast hip hop and the history of the West Coast. Trust and believe, they most of these people showed up because Kendrick probably asked them to. And you know it's real when people that couldn't make it are sick that they couldn't make it. Like Snoop Dogg. I think he's on tour. I know us. Vince Staples was on tour and wish he could have made it. Now, <laughs> I know most people probably saw that whole the, the game IG Live. I'm not going to go into that. But, uh, yeah. I think this is just a congratulations to the West Coast, man. And I don't think I. I when I, <laughs> who would have thought that listening to Section Eighty, like when you listen to Section Eighty and when you listen to Overly Dedicated, obviously Kendrick Lamar's first projects. Who would have thought that that person could arguably rival? being the face of an entire coast. That's what I, 
again, I, I couldn't get over the feeling of that we will never see anything like this again. And if we want to go to the beef, which obviously I've talked about here, I was thinking to myself most of the time, and I even said it out loud because I was watching with uh, Brittany, and I was like, yo, I don't know how Drake comes back from this. Look, I'm a fan of Kendrick Lamar. Obviously, he's one of my favorite artists ever. I'm a fan of Drake. I think it's very interesting what people tend to believe or or want to believe and don't want to believe coming out of this beef. There are people that obviously believe, you know, one of these people may or may not indulge in uh, illegal activities with people. Some people believe it, some people don't. Some people believe that one of these individuals is domestic is a domestic abuser. Some of the one of these people, some of these people, some of the fans think that one of these people, this kid is not his. I think it's very interesting when you look at, you know, rap beefs and what either lies or truths come out of rap beefs and what the fans uh, decide to agree with and not agree with. But put all that aside, man. I'm not saying Drake is done. I'm not saying Drake is out of here. I'm not saying Drake can't flourish. Drake won't flourish. I'm not saying Drake's career is done. But I'm almost sure that his career is altered forever because of this. And when I say I don't know how you can come back from this, what I'm saying is I don't know how you can. There was a good a good time when Drake was the most loved rapper, most loved person in rap slash hip hop. And now that love is drastically being called to the carpet. And it's almost it almost feels like the whole West Coast doesn't like Aubrey Graham. And a lot of people don't. Yo, I, it's also funny that a lot of people are viewing um, the attendees of this concert and saying, oh, he hates Drake. He hates Drake. He hates Drake. Like The Weeknd was there. SZA was there. You know? I'm not saying they hate Drake, but obviously people are. And I'm not saying they don't. I'm just saying, oh, if, it's like if you are attached in any way, shape, or form to this you have a beef with Drake, whether that was Ty Dolla Sign going up there, Ty the Creator. And I don't really look at it as that. I just look at it as this was a celebration for L.A. And obviously, <laughs> the celebration was to celebrate the career death of Aubrey Graham. By the hands of that man, Kendrick Lamar. But moreover, and and more importantly, it just showed a level of unif unification that I didn't think that California had in them. Again, watching that an incredible four hour display of just beauty. I just couldn't get over the fact that or I couldn't get over the feeling of this is historic and this is such a beauty to see. So shouts out to Kendrick Lamar, shout out to DJ Mustard, shout out to every single person that was involved in the pop out. Shout out to the Juneteenth people, you know, because it was a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. 
And there you have it. That's been today's episode of the Unpopular Podcast. I truly, truly, truly appreciate you guys. If you want an Unpopular Podcast shirt, hoodie, sweater, long sleeve joggers, the link's in the description below. At multiple different colors, multiple different designs. Get your Unpopular Podcast merch today. Also, please subscribe to the YouTube channel, man. I appreciate everyone that has subscribed. I appreciate everyone that will subscribe. It definitely means a lot that you care enough to press that subscribe button. Uh, if you like the content, tell a friend to tell a friend to tell a friend to subscribe. It means so much. Also, I understand that some people only watch on YouTube and there are some people that only list on DSPs, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Pandora, wherever you get your podcast 9.9 times out of 10, the unpopular podcast is there because you're listening to it. I appreciate you guys. Please follow. Please subscribe if you haven't. It means so much to me. No supporter, no platform is more important than the other. I appreciate all you guys and much love to all you guys. Also, please subscribe to the socials. Uh, I pretty much post daily on either Instagram or TikTok. Uh, a lot of the shorts that you see on YouTube, they have to get cut down to a minute. They're usually much longer. Go to Instagram, go to TikTok, watch the full short. Um, that's where we can debate. You can go back and forth to me. Just keep it respectful. And I don't mind going back and forth. It just means that you're passionate about what you feel. It just means that you are supporting and you care about what I have to say, even if even if you think it's wrong. I appreciate all of it, man. It definitely means a lot. So please follow the socials. Uh, hey, man. I'm not going to jinx anything, but before we... <laughs> by the time I'm recording this... Game, what, six of the Stanley Cup final is tonight. All I'm saying, let's go Edmonton. <laughs> and until next time, much love.